Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Leland Vittert. The media is making Americans feel terrible about America and about being Americans. We're going to try and change that tonight. But consider this. 80% of us say democracy is at risk. Is it or is it just the media making us feel that way? We'll dive in. Plus, some used cars are now worth more than they were when they were new. In a word, it's crazy. And a few folks are getting rich, while the rest of us pay higher prices for gas, cars, food, just about everything else. We're going to introduce you to one of the big winners and ask him if it's fair. But first, in America tonight, new evidence that closing schools is doing irreputable harm to America's children and to protect them from a virus. All of this harm is being done to protect them from a virus less likely to kill them than riding in a car. That's not us saying this, but the New York Times. No way to grow up is how they write it. For the past two years, Americans have accepted more harm to children in exchange for less harm to adults. Think about that. Life's supposed to be the other way around. As adults and parents, we are supposed to sacrifice and risk for the next generation. Most parents would lay down their life for their kids. Yet teachers, and more importantly, the teachers' unions, have set back an entire generation. Despite overwhelming evidence that the current wave of COVID is akin to the common cold for the vaccinated, the unions are doubling down. There are 3,713 schools closed right now. You would think teachers would want to keep the schools open. They should be dedicated to our kids. Nope. Here in Chicago, the teachers union is voting to defy the public school system and shut down in-person learning. The union is voting tonight, literally, if they're going to show up to work or not. 340,000 Chicago public school kids don't know if they'll have school. That means all their parents don't know what they'll do if their kids suddenly are home for the day. They're going to tell everybody tonight sometime after 9 o'clock. We're going to let you know how the vote goes. It's not just Chicago. Around the country, COVID shutdowns and remote learning have hit most states once again. This is just in the past month. Let's be real. There are dangers to getting COVID. For a vaccinated and boosted teacher, the chance you have of dying is roughly 1.5 in a million. There are 3.7 million teachers in America, roughly the size of the population of Los Angeles. So that means that if you could guarantee remote learning would protect every teacher in America from getting COVID, you would save a grand total of four lives. Four. Now for the cost of virtual learning, because those costs are real too. Here's how the New York Times lays it out. Children fell far behind in school during the first year of the pandemic and have not caught up. We haven't seen this kind of academic achievement crisis in living memory, they quote one expert. Black, Latino, and poor kids have been hurt by far the worst. Many children and teenagers are experiencing mental health problems. Suicide attempts have risen 51% for teenage girls. And behavior problems in the classroom are at an all-time high. Gun violence is up. 101 kids were killed in Chicago last year from gunfire. Six have died from COVID. That's right. Roughly 17 times more kids in Chicago have died from gunshots than COVID. And there's growing evidence that those listed at COVID deaths perhaps died with COVID rather than from COVID. More on that in a minute. President Biden has done a complete 180, now saying keeping schools open is important, realizing that perhaps parents should have more power than the teachers unions. Schools can and should be open this winter. We have all the tools to keep kids safe. Unvaccinated kids are at risk, yet the vaccinated are going to have a way to protect them. Get vaccinated. Again, exactly what are those kids at risk for? Nobody wants their kid to get sick, but kids went to school every year during flu season without masks or social distancing or eating lunch outdoors in the freezing cold as they are in many cities right now. Marty McCary, a doctor from John Hopkins today, wrote, in other words, a total of 803 American children have died from COVID or with COVID over the past two years. That's less than the number of total deaths from both influenza and RSV infection in a typical year before the pandemic. Teachers unions weren't allowed to strike then. A recent study of children in Germany found that no healthy children between the ages of 5 and 17 died of COVID during a 15-month period when nearly all were unvaccinated. Zero. Not one in the entire country. 
As we said above, the chance of a vaccinated and boosted teacher dying is statistically insignificant. So why exactly would the teachers unions be for closing schools? And why are democratic politicians in big cities bending at the knee? We of course have invited the teachers unions, their representatives and others on to discuss who they say keeping schools closed is worth it. They have declined that invitation, although the invitation remains open. We are grateful to have two women imminently involved in the discussion. Uh, with that, uh, we bring in both of them, Sharon McKeenan and Stephanie Edmonds. Ladies, appreciate uh, you being with us. Thank you. Uh, all right. I don't have a reason, uh, Sharon, for the teachers unions wanting to keep schools closed and remote learning going on other than they just don't go to work, want to go to work. Do you have a better reason? Well, I mean, really, a only a entity that is as corrupt as the teachers unions could think that, that this is a good idea. Again, I know there are so many educators that are good educators. They want to be in the classroom. As a parent, I was part of that uh, lawsuit that reopened schools in California. And I can't believe that, that this is even a conversation at this point. Uh, it was an absolute disaster the first time on distance learning. There was over a 300% increase uh, in failing grades in our school district. Uh, as a parent, I saw those mental health impacts firsthand, uh, but it all comes down to money. We saw the unions using these school closures as bargaining chips to get th other things on their agenda that they wanted. And it's absolutely horrific. That should never be done to children. Their needs should be put first. Stephanie, uh, you're one of the teachers who wants to put students first. You've been fighting as a teacher to keep schools open. I, I have to imagine that makes you a rather unpopular person in the teacher's lounge. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm fighting also my own battle right now here in New York City um, with the mandates. But I have been fighting for the schools to be open for over a year now. So certainly last year I was not very popular. However, it was um, the, only the teachers were in the building who wanted to be in the building because last year we had a hybrid situation. So that did um, provide me some reprieve because I was in the building with teachers who wanted to be there. So as was stated, there are a lot of teachers who do want to be there. So if there's a lot of teachers who teach there. Yeah. Why are the unions then fighting for the people who don't want to do their jobs? I think it has to do with the way that these unions are really in bed with the Democratic Party. Um, I am or I was a member of the AFT and I get emails from Randy Weingarten that are basically just copy and paste Democratic talking points. And I believe that they're using it to continue fear. Yeah. In a place like New York City, the fear on the streets is palpable. Yeah, Almost overnight, yeah, you it's, could it's feel interesting. it change. Yeah, it's interesting though, Stephanie, because Democrats have kids too. You got Eric Adams, the, the mayor now of New York, saying, hey, we're going to keep schools open. There seems to be this split now between the Democratic Party and the unions. What do you make of that? Well, I'm seeing um, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that, uh, you know, the, the CTA is the main uh, contributor to Governor Newsom's campaign, right? And we've heard the uh, union president say that she would like to see vaccination for five and up. And we're fighting here. Uh, I'm part of, I'm the founder of Let Them Choose, and we're fighting against those vaccine mandates. And so we're seeing a lot of intersecting agendas here that aren't in the best uh, interest of kids. Uh, we just had a judge rule that the vaccine mandate um, school district by school district isn't uh, isn't legal. Uh, but we're seeing that there's a lot of money at play here. And I think those things are intersecting between, like you said, the Democratic Party, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the unions. And again, it should be about education. Stephanie, As a teacher, Stephanie you have, you seen, have you seen a growing number of teachers willing to come back? Or is it clear that there's a group who sees this is an opportunity to do remote learning and not have to do their job and they're going to milk that for as long as they can. I, I definitely think that there is um, a sizable group, though I still think it is a minority, um, a sizable but loud group that is like that. Okay. Um, however, I, I think that she's correct that we see intersecting agendas going on here. And for example, in New York City, the only thing a child five and up can do is go to school. 
They often can't even do their after school activities. They can't play sports. They can't go to museums. They can't go to restaurants. So I also do think that keeping the schools open in New York City is a tactic to try and force more kids to get vaccinated, a sort of de facto mm -hmm. mandate. Sharon, I'm interested in this from the, the kids' health perspective. Uh, where do you see this going for the teachers' unions in terms of saying they want to be protected from kids? Is, are we going to get to a point where the unions will say we're not going to teach kids who are unvaccinated? I mean, it is going that way in California, right? We're seeing these vaccine mandates pushed forward and it doesn't make any sense. The rhetoric at this point is making no sense uh, because if the vaccines work, then the teachers have access to them. And uh, so why would that need to be pushed on the children? Um, and we know the kids themselves are at very low risk from the virus, uh, mm -hmm. like you pointed out earlier, but they're at what they're at really high risk from is the mental health impact. And the AAP finally came out recently and said that our kids are in a mental health crisis and it's Sh Sharon forgive forgive me I don't yeah. know who the AAP is <laughs> oh the American Academy of Pediatrics okay. and it's due to these restrictions and what they've gone through during the pandemic parents have been saying this all along good educators have been saying this and we haven't been listened to yeah I, I, I I'm disappointed we couldn't get anyone on to, to have this other side who who really some have sincerely held beliefs and in fears I was on the radio earlier uh, Stephanie and I had someone say well we have an immunocompromised member of our household, therefore the school should shut down for a couple of weeks so the kid doesn't bring COVID home. Is that a legitimate argument? I mean, I think the problem is that the schools have used their powers to instill more fear into families instead of assuring them that these places are safe. Um, and this is a legacy that predates the, the pandemic, of course, but it just really um, it came home in the pandemic. So schools already didn't have parents trust. Now they're instilling fear in them more and more. So I can see how somebody legitimately feels that way. Now, do I think it's justified? No. Um, however, if families do feel that way and they're able to give their kids the appropriate education, by all means, yeah, if they, they want to take keep, your kid home, yeah, they want to school them. Yeah, no one's but, no one's making them send their kid to school. Um, Stephanie, are you seeing what Sharon's talking about? Are there kids who clearly are having major learning deficits and in, in ill effects from the remote learning? Uh, so, like I said, I, I'm not currently in the New York City buildings. I'm banned from the buildings. Um, but from having my own student in school and from looking at the data very closely, it is clear. And, you know, even from the beginning of the year when I was allowed in the buildings, um, yeah, students are behind. Are... And, and not only the academics, but socially. Think about if you are locked away for a year, a year and a half, you're going to come out. If you went in as an eighth grader and you come out as a 10th grader, you're still an eighth grader. So yeah, we have a lot point. of like immaturity yeah, no, and, and we're just hearing, like social isolation. Yeah, you know? no, that, that's definitely happening. Uh, you, you all both rightly point out there's an irony now that you're seeing this turn in the Democratic Party by uh, Eric Adams, by uh, even President Biden against the teachers unions, them standing uh, on their own. Ladies, uh, Sharon, Stephanie, I'm really appreciative of both of you. And obviously you both have uh, taken some really courageous stands on principle. We're glad you're here. Obviously our invitation to somebody from the teachers union who's taking their own stand uh, remains open. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Tomorrow on News Nation Rush Hour, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona joins Nicole Burley live 545 Eastern, 445 Central. They'll talk about keeping kids and teachers safe during the pandemic as some schools return to remote learning. If you have a question you want us to ask, we'll do that for you. Go to newsnationnow.com slash ask to submit a question. This will go down as one of the most progressive administrations in American history. That was President Biden as a candidate. He also promised to shut down COVID, shut down the virus in his words. Neither of those things have come true. Now, two years later, since he made the first promise, the left is losing their patience as his agenda stalls. Politico reports several Democratic strategists believe progressives are mapping out a primary challenge to Biden in 2024. Quote, the chatter, which was virtually non-existent weeks ago, has suddenly burst into public view in the wake of Senator Joe Manchin killing the president's climate and social spending bill. 
Phil Wegman, Real Clear Politics, White House correspondent with us now, friend of the show. Uh, Phil, I feel like we kind of hear this all the time. How much is this is progressives just trying to rattle the cage? A lot of it is progressives who are trying to get the president to pick up his phone, pick up his pen, and move unilaterally because they see that, yeah, he might have a very progressive vision like he promised on the campaign trail, like former President Obama also vouched for him. But wanting something is not enough to change the political arithmetic in Congress. He might have a vision like FDR, but he doesn't have uh, FDR's majorities. So that's why I think progressives are pushing him right now to go the executive order route and uh, get some of the things that they want done. What do you make of what we did, the conversation we just heard and how the teachers unions are now uh, sort of been iced out of the Democratic Party, if you will? I think it's incredibly important because there's no other kitchen table topic that matters. I mean, this is first and foremost, right? You want your kids to be able to go to school. And this is a pressure point for the administration. On the first full day of the Biden White House, the first lady invites uh, two guests to come speak there. They are the heads of the two largest teachers unions in the country. She tells them that President Biden is always going to have their back. She's also uh, a member of the, the, the National Educators Association. But uh, what we have seen is that those unions have not always been simpatico with the, the Biden White House. And right now, uh, the president and his team realizes that to get back to normal, mm. parents want their kids back in school. Yeah, it, it seems as though the, the soccer moms that swung in 2020 to President Biden somehow are now having more power than the teachers unions. First time we've seen that and where you have parents in the unions really diametrically opposed on an issue. Presidents pick sides. Something about that probably has to do with his, his poll numbers, which are dismal. You and I have talked about this before. Biden's disapproval rating reached a new high in December. CNBC has him 56 disapproved, 44% approved. Some have him a little bit lower on that, on the approval uh, numbers. It's interesting, if you talk to progressives, uh, they will tell you the reason his disapproval numbers are so high is because it's far left liberals who don't approve of him and it hasn't really changed among independent and republicans the answer to this is to move farther to the left and we've certainly seen biden double down on some of his more progressive uh agenda items for instance after the loss in virginia he says that the answer is not to moderate build back better but to put pedal to metal and, and and get that through get that to his desk i think that if you look at the approval numbers that you just cited that's not surprising it generally tracks with where president biden has been in the real clear politics average for some time but if you take a closer look at the cross tabs, there's an alarming trend here, which is the two areas where he was uh, seen as, as being positive, the economy and COVID on day one of his administration, mm -hmm. those strengths have turned into weaknesses and you see more Americans sort of doubting him. The, the central premise of his campaign was that he could return things to normal. At least according to the polls, it doesn't seem that the American public believes him. Yeah, you think about it, if the poll was reversed, if it was 56% approved, 44% disapproved, 46, it was 44 disapproved, 56 approved, we wouldn't be talking about a primary challenge. You seem to point out or think that this isn't really a real thing. Is there any names out there that people say could actually mount a challenge? Well, I'm already surprised that we're in 2022, that it's a midterm year. Uh, the, the, the presidential primary would be so far away in the future, and I think that a lot of dominoes would have to, to topple before that happens. Um, one of the, the big things that is also looming here is whenever you have a conversation um, about you know replacing the top of a ticket, um, that presupposes that you would have a, a bench to draw from. And right now, I don't think that there are a lot of folks who could step up and, um, and challenge President Biden right now. I mean, I, I think hey, that's outside of the realm of possibility. Yeah, you don't really see a Ted Kennedy out there to a Jimmy Carter this time um, in the 1970s. Hey, Phil, it's always a great conversation. Your reporting on Real Clear Politics is uh, continued to be exceptional. We'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Phil's got a lot to cover this coming week, including this. Is our democracy in peril? Most Americans actually think it is. First, is that true? Second, whose fault is it? Plus, it's insanely more expensive to buy a used car now than it was a year ago or even five years ago. What's behind the outrageous price increases? And we're going to introduce you to one of the men getting rich off of it.
Welcome back. Get this. More than half of the households in the United States do not have enough money to buy a used car because the prices have skyrocketed so much due to demand. Right now, the average monthly payment for a used car is $520 per month, even when financed for the average of nearly six years. That average, by the way, is the monthly payment that was needed for a brand new vehicle five years ago. Two years ago, the average payment for a used vehicle was just under $400 a month, about $380 five years, $365 a decade ago. The rise in used car prices is a result of the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, chip makers shifted production from vehicles to computers. People began working from home and computers and laptop demand rose. But stimulus money helped boost the economy, which prompted demand for cars again. Chip makers couldn't respond fast enough for production. So now those with used cars are hanging on to them longer instead of trading them in. A man who knows all about this, Tom Mayoli, he's a car dealer in New Jersey, has five dealerships, both new and used cars, joins us uh, now. All right, Tom, um, who's getting rich off of all of this? Well, you know, it's interesting because it's like the housing market, right? If, as a dealer, clearly there's, our margins are up, the used car pricing is up, but when we go to buy a used car so that we have to resell it in the market or someone trades it, we have to pay top dollar to get that car. So it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting dynamic right now, but you also, you know, what's driving this process is not only the shortage of chips, but you also have companies like Hertz Enterprise and and the use and the uh, the, the uh, rental car companies and uh, who are buying now renting out used cars because they can't get new cars. It's it's a, it's it's the, cr the craziest time I've ever seen in the auto industry. And you know predictions are it's going to go through 2022, 20, maybe into 23. So when I asked the initial question of who's getting rich, it sounds like kind of like when oil prices go up, the oil companies do better. You're doing better, but not as well as people might might think. How does this end exactly? Of course. Well, you know, listen, at some point, it's like musical chairs, right? It's like who gets stuck with the chair, right? So it depends on when you bought in. It's like the real estate market. You know, in the real estate market, there's a theory called the greater fool theory. Who, You know, so you bought something for a million dollars, and now it's worth a million two. The next person is willing to pay a million five. But at some point, the music stops, yeah. and somebody gets left with the chair, and, the, and that person loses money. So it's very difficult as a car dealer. Although we need inventory, we, there is no inventory. There's no new car inventory. We, we, yeah, well, we're it's... buying every used car we can get our hands on. At some point, you're going to take a loss. When the music stops, you're going to take a loss. Right well, now, when, we're when the music the stops, of it. But this is not. When the music stops, there's a lot of consumers, though, conceivably, who are also going to take a loss, too, right? Oh, absolutely. The consumer is the one that's ultimately going to take it on the head because they're the ones that overpaid for it. It's like buying a house. You know, if, if, you've, if, if you're the fourth person in right. and you bought at the top of the market and the market corrects, you're going to get stuck with your house that's worth less than, than what you paid yeah, for. There's a lot of people this in, happens all the time. There's a lot of people who are still waiting for their house to be worth what they bought it at at the top of the bubble Correct. Uh, in 2008. You can see that now rhyming but not repeating with used cars. What's fueling Correct. the demand? You, you know, in order for prices to go up, you got to have demand. At some point, are people just saying, I'm not going to buy a car that was $10,000 more than it was a year and a half ago? No, it's, um, it's unbelievable. They're coming out in groves. They're buying people. The demand is, is greater than ever. You know, we went through the pandemic. People were home. They weren't out using their vehicles. All of a sudden, now they're back to work. They're driving to work. They're driving mm -hmm. their kids to school. Really, what they want to do is they want to buy new cars, but there are no new cars available. Well, the I, it's manufacturers funny. can't... Per it's funny you say that because when you watch television... Uh, especially NFL games, there's car commercials still all the time. Why are manufacturers advertising things if there's not enough new cars? Well, listen, the manufacturer is very smart. What they want to do is they want to keep the consumer uh, highlighted and focused on their brand so that when ultimately the market comes back, they can, can, they can retain those customers. But really, if you look at what's going on in the marketplace regarding advertising, there's no, historically, they would advertise specials and what the lease prices were. That's not happening anymore. Right now, they're just advertising the brand. And people are coming in on a constant basis. The demand is growing on a, on a daily basis. And then the other thing that's happening in this, in this cycle is we're getting long in a tooth. And when I 
I say long in the tooth is all these used cars that are out there that people are driving because they can't get new ones, they're, they, they no longer have 60 and 70,000 miles on it. They have 100 and 110. Huh. You know, a car has a life cycle. When that life cycle ends, it comes to a point when the car's not worth fixing anymore. You know, and, and that's where we're getting in this cycle. So the, the pent up demand is just getting greater every day. Hey, you know what, Tom? I really appreciate you coming on and talking with us. This is a, a fascinating perspective yeah. um, and great Very information. Very fascinating. Yeah, no, 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 really. And, and your honesty about this is uh, is refreshing. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have you back, uh, yeah. hopefully, at least once before the music stops, all right? Absolutely. <laughs> great to see you. Good to see you. Coming up, you know who's not worried about COVID or democracy in America? Wall Street. We're going to talk to someone who can explain why things are on a tear on the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome back. Congressmen are supposed to be sober, serious, and thoughtful. When they say things, perhaps we should listen. They want us to listen. Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell was on MSNBC with a dire warning on what would happen if Democrats lose their midterm majorities. I'm worried that if Republicans uh, win in the midterm elections, uh, that voting as we know it in this country uh, will be gone. This is not only the most important election. Uh, if we don't get it right, it could be the last election. If we don't get it right, he means if you don't vote for a Democrat, it would be the last election. It's not just on the left. Politicians on the right have been warning that democracy is in jeopardy. Here's Senator Ted Cruz back in May. This legislation is designed to ensure that Democrats never lose another election. This is designed to make it impossible for Democrats to lose power. So Ted Cruz and Eric Swalwell now agree on something. And if you turn on certain TV hosts on both sides of the aisle, they're also warning that we've reached a dangerous point. That the insurrection on our democracy is still alive and sadly thriving. What we're watching here in real time is the death of democracy. Who thought Joy Reid and Tucker Carlson would ever agree? It's tempting to write this off as just political theater, but it may be having an impact on all of us. Scary impact. A new poll from USA Today and Suffolk University finds more than 8 in 10 registered voters are now either very or somewhat worried about the future of our democracy. We bring in Colby Hall, founding editor of Mediaite and News Nation producer. All right, Colby, are people right to be worried or are they just watching too much cable TV? Well, they're watching the wrong cable news TV. There's some great <laughs> cable news TV to watch, but no, I do believe that... Um, you know, I think, I think it's not a worry or even alarm. There is some concern. I think the concern is misguided, though. I think what we're seeing is a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that when there are doomsayers on both sides of the aisle that are elected officials that are then amplified by media outlets that are literally like trying to gin up conflict and, and draw viewers based on that conflict, well, then, then people start to believe what they're hearing. And you yeah. say something over and over and over again, it starts at the top and then gets amplified through, you know, very partisan media outlets that leads to those poll results. You know, it's interesting. You and I have talked about this before. There's 330 million or so Americans. At any one given point, 10 million Americans are watching cable TV on a given night. That means 320 million Americans are doing something else. Uh, <laughs> so you think about that, but then you get to 80% of Americans say there's a problem with our democracy. That's a lot more than the people watching cable TV. Well, I think that's true. Um, I think there's the long been the sort of nattering nabobs or the chattering class. And I think, you know, what we've seen over the last 20 years is the real sort of like the, the power, the leadership power has left DC and has moved, that vacuum of leadership has moved to opinion programming across the, the partisan dial on a lot of cable news networks. And so even though there aren't as many people watching as that exist in, in television, that, that sort of amplifies and sets the mood so that, you know, if someone in your family watches a lot of CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, and they're at the dinner table, well, they're going to say the thing that they said. And it's become this weird sort of like really negative and kind of evil or pernicious, uh, you know, sports game of our team wins at all cost to the degree that you have Eric Swalwell saying that this may be the last election. Or on the right, you've heard people say that, like, if you want to be a socialist or communist country, vote Democratic. So yeah. um, well, what, yeah, what's you, interesting you, is... I, go I was going to pick up on that. It's also, it's not just whether you you're at the dinner table with them. It's if you see their Facebook or you follow them on Instagram or you 
have any interaction with people for a certain group, cable television and politics has now become sports-like. You know, you should talk about baseball or football or whatever. Uh, this is Anna Navarro saying that things are different, of course, for Republicans than Democrats. Take a listen. Look, I felt, I felt that Joe, Donald Trump had not been legitimately elected. I thought he'd gotten help from the Russians. But you know what? It would have never occurred to me to take up arms against Donald Trump. That's just not what we do in America. Just investigated him for three years and figured out he didn't get it from the Russians. But I digress. The, I guess the larger question here, though, is it's the, the facts have gotten totally lost in this in cable news. Fair? Or certain cable totally news? Totally fair. And I mean, the odd thing about Anna Navarro is that she had just sort of, you know, ripped into Trump for the big lie and then later admitted that she also didn't think that he was illegitimate. Um, you know, it, it's the facts get lost, but we're, I don't want to get too philosophical, but the problem is that we don't necessarily, we can no longer agree on the same set of facts. I think, you know, Kellyanne Conway was onto something when she said alternate facts. And we live in this postmodern world where it's all, it's not feelings, but you can choose to cherry pick the thing that you want to believe in and say that that represents everything. One person on Fox News or CNN saying one thing then becomes, you sort of blanket mm. the media. And, and what ends up happening is it's a sort of confirmation bias. You end up like consuming the thing that makes you feel better about the, and we get deep, more deeply mm. entrenched. And, you know, I don't know how we get out of this. Um, I thought it was a pandemic that was going to keep us, get us back and centered, and it turns out that's only made things worse. Yeah, no, it certainly has, and people have, people have retreated. You don't have to interact with people you don't agree with because you just interact with the same people you like. Uh, you said something interesting about facts. Um, I was talking to a Democratic congresswoman a couple of years ago uh, and made a po your point that we can't agree on what the facts are, and she goes, forget what the facts are. We can't even agree on what a fact is. So... Uh, <laughs> There's, there's something there. Hey, Colby, it's always a great conversation. We always admire what you guys do at Media. I um, call on balls and strikes on both sides. I keep appreciate it, yeah, that. You keep, having me, Leo. Yeah, you keep us inside the riverbanks. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks, dude. Well, as we've been talking about, there's a lot of Americans rattled by the latest COVID surge, and even the teachers' unions are using it to not go back to work. The markets aren't rattled. Two of the three major industries closed a little bit in the red today, but the Dow's in record territory. The S&P is near record territory for the second time this week. It's a stark change from last year when we saw massive dips over fears of lockdowns. Here's the market prediction from CNBC's Jim Cramer. Here's what we do know. Things can and do go right. It can be different this time. Sometimes you have to suspend your short-term skepticism to make long-term money. We'll hope spring again in 2022. Investors may not be worried. The average American, though, is. A CNBC survey shows three out of four believe the economy's not in good shape. Tonight, we're going to talk about that disconnect with Emil Michael, former senior VP and chief business officer at Uber, current chairman and CEO of DPCM Capital. Emil, good to see you. Uh, the market is forward-looking. People are betting real money that things are going to get better. We've spent the whole show talking about rising case counts of COVID, uh, rising used car prices, uh, and the democracies in peril. Who's right? Um, well, the, the market is always betting forward, as you said. And I think what, what is happening now is investors are looking at South Africa and UK and some of the countries that hit got Omicron first. And now they're looking at the case counts and they're looking at the hospitalizations and they're saying this might be over very fast. Um, and that's why you saw since the beginning of the year this run up um, that doesn't seem to be slowing down because people are saying like, wow, maybe everyone gets this. It's not as bad as we thought. It goes away quickly and we're into a new era post COVID. Yeah, you know, we're, we're in. We're in the 2022 midterms. Eric Swalwell, if we don't get it right, it could be the last election, meaning if Democrats don't win, it's clear the market sort of doesn't believe any of these doomsday prophecies on either side. I, I don't think so. I think the market's used to gridlock. The market's used to slow, steady progress. They're used to divided government. Um, so I don't think that the market looks at this and says, this is something that is out of the ordinary from what we've seen in the last 20 years. Um, and if they did, I think you, you would see a visible correction in a way that that would be shocking. Right. People would be buying gold hand over fist. Uh, it, it brings up this interesting point. I don't know if you were able to hear the car guy who was on earlier. Uh, he said eventually the music stops and obviously the music stopped 
uh, in 2000, 2001. It stopped in 2008. It stopped for just a couple of minutes, if you will, uh, back in March of uh, 2020. Uh, is it going to stop again? I mean, it, it will for some industries. Like at some point, the cars will come off the, the assembly lines and they'll be bought and there were, the prices will normalize, right? And then the, the use of Zoom will moderate because people aren't using it every day for every meeting. So you'll have an adjustment uh, back to some sense of normalcy, but I don't feel like this particular market rally is gonna end like 08 or 01 because the fundamentals are pretty strong. Yeah, well, and it's interesting that you've got three out of four Americans saying that the economy has problems. Then you also have one of the greatest years on record for the market and the White House saying this. Take a listen. We have some of the strongest economic growth underlying this economic recovery that we've seen in decades. We have the strongest labor market that we have seen in, a, in quite some time. And we have household incomes and household balance sheets that are in a historically strong position, even when taking into account uh, price increases. And yet so much of Main Street isn't buying it. Yeah, because Main Street goes out every day and looks at that gas station price price uh, banner that they have out there and they go to the supermarket and they see prices go up. And that hasn't happened for 30 years. People haven't seen these kind of price increases. So that alone could cause a large number of Americans to think that the economy is not doing well. And for them, in those particular situations, they're right. Yeah, it, it's not doing well. Um, I'm interested, you, know, you worked in the Obama administration and you think now also about uh, so many parallels to the, the late 1970s. Uh, how, how worried do you think the White House is, the Biden administration now, that we are in that 1970s inflationary period that did not do so well for Jimmy Carter? Uh, you know, uh, my view is that the, the main difference between now and the late 70s with, with Carter, the Carter administration, is that there are a lot of jobs open right now that are not yeah. being filled. In the late 70s, that wasn't the case. There weren't enough jobs and there was inflation. So you had this stagnant economy that wasn't creating jobs and inflation. Now we have jobs we can't fill plus inflation. So yeah. it's a little different in that way. Um, how you treat it, we don't know yet. Yeah. Well, I don't think anyone next has time, the answer. Ne next time we have you on, we'll talk a little bit about, about why folks aren't, aren't picking up those jobs. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll end with what Warren Buffett used to say is nobody ever went broke betting on America. Uh, Emil, it was a great conversation. Thank you. That's right. Thank, thank you. Take care. Yeah. All right, Lee. You too. Up next, the debate over Latinx. Latino groups want to do away with the label. So why did everybody start using it in the first place? Strike Latin X from the dictionary. Latinos evidently no longer want anyone using the term Latin X. Elected officials, major newspapers like the Miami Herald and Latino organizations are now calling for the term to be dropped. The term Latin X is no longer the preferred pronoun of the representative Ruben Galeco of Arizona, Galeco of Arizona, spoke out against the Latin X term on Twitter, saying Latino politicos use the term to appease white rich progressives who think that the term Latino, that's the term Latinos use. Very few Latin Americans ever actually use the term. According to a Pew study, only 23% of Latinos had ever heard of the term, and only 3% use it to describe themselves. Former Deputy National Press Secretary for the Democratic National Convention, Jose Arista Munoz, joins us. Jose, good to see you, my friend. How is my it voice. that we got to a point where certain people were called racist and unwoke for using a term that only 3% of the group that it was being described to used? Look, I think first and foremost, uh, I don't know who came up uh, with the term. I mean, it, it, it was probably a communication shop in, in D.C., but look, they got it wrong. I mean, I think that the fact of the matter is that Latinos want to be called what they are, Latinos. And another respect uh, to Latinas, right? I think that the term was supposed to be inclusive, but we can be inclusive without changing the terminology. I think what people got to do in, in Congress and in Washington is not debate terminology. They should actually be debating policy that's going to help uh, Latinos and the American people. You know, it's interesting when you talk about debating policy that helps Latinos, 
Latinos now are moving, especially in your home state of Florida, pretty strongly to the Republican Party. Is this kind of PC culture one of the reasons? Well, look, I think first and foremost, over 70% of Latinos uh, are with the Democratic Party. So whatever percentage of, of Latinos are moving to the Republican Party is not going to affect us as a party because I think Latinos uh, in large understand that for years, Democrats yeah, have been hold, hold on, oh, Jose, I, I got to stop you, though, because if you look at the 2016 versus 2020 change, especially in Florida, Miami-Dade, uh, Republican plus 51 in Latino precincts, Miami-Dade Latin America's Republican plus 120%. Uh, Texas, we saw the border counties move strongly uh, away from Democrats. You don't have to swing that many percentage points to make a real difference. Well, I think first and foremost, that doesn't take into account uh, the large percentage of Latinos that didn't even vote. So, look, I, I'm not a huge believer in, in polls. I think uh, the community, me as a Venezuelan American, I, I deal with Latinos across the country every single day, and I can tell you in large, uh, they're all Democrats. But um, what I can tell you is that it, going back to the terminology of Latinx, I mean, it's proven that it, it's, it's useless. We don't need it. I don't know who made it up. I think Latinos uh, should be respected and just call us what we are. We're Latinos. I'm Latinas. And again, let's debate uh, what we elected uh, the president and Congress uh, to do, which is solve the, the problems to the American people are facing. Yeah, and in 2021, we said goodbye to some words. We got some new words. We can say goodbye to, to Latinx. Jose, good to see you. Take care. Enjoy Thank the sun. Mom. It's only 20 degrees here hey, in Chicago. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> After the break, the rise and fall of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes. She's going to prison for fraud. What lessons America can learn from this? Your parents always told you if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Well, for a while, it sounded pretty good. Remember Elizabeth Holmes in her black turtleneck saying she could diagnose 200 diseases with a single finger prick of blood? We've got an incredible opportunity to try to uphold a legacy in Silicon Valley of changing the world. And Disrupting the world. We're working 24-7 to do it. Hmm. Now she's going to be spending 24-7 as a guest of the federal government. Holmes faces the possibility of 20 years in prison on each of three counts of wire fraud, one count of conspiracy to commit fraud for telling investors her magical machine worked when it didn't. Big names bought into Theranos, Rupert Murdoch of the Wall Street Journal, Fox News founder Henry Kissinger, and General James Mattis, among others, before he became Secretary of State. The media, of course, as you saw, loved her. The youngest billionaire in the world. Mm -hmm. Is that heady when you hear that? You know, it's, it's not what matters. Um, what matters is how well we do in trying to make people's lives better. I mean, that's, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I work the way that I work. And that's why I love what I'm doing so much. The journalism back then. Actually, it was a journalist who brought her down. John Kerry of the Wall Street Journal got a hold of the story and would not let go. Hats off to him. It brings us back to where we started. My parents were right. Yours probably were as well. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. For all our problems, sometimes the media is the best hope for democracy. More on the media and more on reasons to hope for America with my friend Dan Abrams. He's next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.